Another Iowa television station traveled to the region in January of 1991 when KWWL in Waterloo sent not one, but two reporters who were there when, in an instant, Operation Desert Shield became Operation Desert Storm. The Delta Battery Marines Reserve Unit, based in Waterloo, was mobilized for active duty. KWWL's Ron Steele and Joel Dickman followed the unit to Camp Lejeune and were scheduled to accompany them to Saudi Arabia. But the military needed space on the plane for more Marines, so the Waterloo journalists were bumped from the flight. They said, listen, you guys can still come. You have your passports, you have the clearance through us, through the Marine Corps and through the United States military. All you have to do is find a way there. So we ended up taking commercial flights. That, the security there was fairly tight, but it was very easy to get the, the, the flight. It was a very expensive flight, which uh, KWWL Television luckily paid for us because uh, we racked up quite a bill. As it happened, Delta Battery had already moved into battle position by the time Steele and Dickman arrived in Dharan, Saudi Arabia, a week before the UN deadline, so their journalistic focus changed. And all I did really was say, anybody from Iowa, and you would be surprised how many times the hands went right up. Hey, where are you from? Or, hey, Ron, how you doing? That type of thing occurred quite often because people actually were from our viewing area. With just a short time to go before the January 15th deadline, many troops are still passing through here, but they're getting processed much faster than they would have a few months ago. These are some of America's best, the 82nd Airborne. Parker, coming in! It's a training mission in the desert of Saudi Arabia, using live grenades and live ammunition in the final days before the United Nations deadline. The funny thing about it is we never did find our local group of Marines. The Delta Battery Marine Corps had already left. They had gone almost the first day they got there, heading north to the Iraq-Kuwait border. And we never did see them. They were, they were the sole reason we went to begin with, but we ran into literally dozens and dozens of other Iowans while we were there. Tom Brokaw was there at the time anchoring for NBC News, and we were in just a small workspace where we had a lot of contact with him. We were working for KWWL, which at the time was owned by Blackhawk Broadcasting, or had been owned by Blackhawk Broadcasting. Tom Brokaw had started his career, his television career, in Sioux City, Iowa for a Blackhawk Broadcasting station. So he realized where we were from, and there was this instant camaraderie and connection. Tom Brokaw kind of took us under his wing, and he would actually, when they'd take him up to the front lines, he would get interviews with Iowans and tell the nightly news crew, listen, this is for those Iowa guys. We're not using this on the, on the broadcast. Uh, I ran into a guy um, who came up behind me in Saudi Arabia, and he tapped me on the shoulder, and he said, hey, Ron Steele, how you doing? I turned around. It was a guy named Larry Eisnoggle, whom I had met as a student at the University of Iowa. But now he's Lieutenant Colonel Larry Eisnoggle, who just happened to be in charge of all of the media in that particular area of Dharan, Saudi Arabia. So here you go, timing is everything. You run into somebody you know, and that helped us a great deal. You can leave Iowa, but you never leave those connections behind, no matter where in the world you travel. If you have that commonality, uh, it is something that is, is very binding. And there's a hosp hospitality that comes with being an Iowan that uh, stretches around the world. We were able to do our, almost our entire newscast on a Sunday night live from Saudi Arabia. Besides covering the Iowans who were involved in the war effort itself, we had looked for Iowans who were living in those communities over there. And Joel and I were live in Saudi Arabia. We also interviewed the parents of Audrey Schweitzer, the teacher from Cedar Falls, they were live in New Hampton. I'm talking to them via satellite live from Dharan, Saudi Arabia. Now, in this day and age, that would be nothing. But back then, in, the, in 1991, that was a pretty big deal for a station our size, I'll tell you. They were there teaching. We had done a, gone to the school and done a story on them and how it was affecting these Iowans in their daily life uh, just trying to live in Saudi Arabia. So we had really connected with them. I think it, it felt good to them to have uh, this crew from home. Uh, they're doing a story with them. It felt good to us having some people with local connections. Having students and their families leave the country has already been tough on the school, but now many teachers are leaving the country as well. This means more work for the teachers that stay at an already stressful time. Not once did anyone approach us and say, you will not cover this or you will change this. I mean, the, I think the military is very good actually about staying away from any kind of censorship because they know there'd be such a ruckus. 
Here in the eastern province of Saudi Arabia, it's already 7 o'clock in the morning. At 7 o'clock Monday morning, January 14th. That, of course, means that the United Nations imposed deadline for the Iraqi forces to get out of Kuwait is now just 24 hours away. After covering Iowans in the war zone for a week, Dickman and Steele boarded a plane to come home, but their return was interrupted by the outbreak of war. We were scheduled to come back on the deadline day, which was January 15th. We were actually in our plane, on the runway, getting ready to take off when the pilot of this aircraft, the 747, came on the intercom and said, ladies and gentlemen, something to the effect that, I hate to tell you this, but all airspace has been closed. And the planes were surrounded by uh, Saudi military in full gear with their, their weapons drawn and said the, the plane isn't leaving, airspace has been closed, uh, U.S. airstrikes have begun. While Steele shot video of the scene, Dickman went to the one phone booth in the airport to call in a report to the station. And in that era before cell phones, when he was done, he found a line of 60 people, all waiting to use the same one pay phone. We were there. We had already checked out of our hotel. We had no place to stay. So we called Ray and Audrey Schweitzer, the teachers who were teaching at the International School in Dahran. Their family took us in, and we ended up staying with them for an additional week while we continued to do more coverage from Saudi Arabia. We did have to go into their bomb shelter a few times. There was this constant sound, this drone of, of aircraft going over. That's the sound constantly, 24 hours a day, while we were in Saudi Arabia after the war had started. And at that time, things had calmed down enough that we could hop onto a military transport, which got us back uh, eventually to Spain. And then once we got to Spain, we hopped on a commercial aircraft from there and got back to Iowa. The duo spent a total of 23 days in Saudi Arabia, triple the amount of time they had planned. You don't want the war to go on, you want the war to end, but you want to do the job at the, to the best of your ability while you're there and have this unique opportunity. So I can honestly say we, we were not ready to come back home. <laughs> I was so thrilled from a career perspective to be there covering a story of that magnitude, I could barely sleep at night uh, to get that kind of an opportunity. Um, I think Ron shared that same enthusiasm, but it was tempered by the fact that uh, he had a little bit more realistic sense of that we were going into a dangerous area. Um, shortly before we had left there, a Scud missile slammed into one of the barracks at one of the army bases there and killed a number of people. So even when you were removed from the front lines, you were in danger there. Um, but it, it seemed it, that didn't uh, fully sink in until I got a few more years on me.